Good. Okay. I think I, I, I think I know who I'm talking to. Exactly what I expected. Very good. Dark matter. Um, new physics on trial at the LHC <coughs> is the n topic of the school. So it's uh, it's good to start with dark matter because dark matter is new physics. So there's no trial needed. Um, in fact, today's lecture is is uh, I'm going to tell you about the trial. Um, um, today's lecture will be, uh, you, you know, um, you've all probably been to some talks that have to do with dark matter, and how did the talk start? Oh, okay, one more thing. Please, um, if, um, if you have any question, um, comments, as long as they're not too many, uh, please, um, please raise your hand, don't raise your hand, just, just yeah, just talk. Um, yes, so how did dark matter uh, talks start? What do you see? Oh, I'm going to lose my microphone at some point. Uh, the of in the yes, the, the pie chart. Uh, there's, the, uh, there's a picture of the bullet cluster, right? And uh, maybe a rotation curve. Okay, and that's it. And then they go on to describe some model that they dreamt up. Um, so, um, now, now that's not enough because that, that one slide is not enough to justify the amount of work and energy that has gone into dark matter, right? Uh, the reason people think and work on dark matter um, so much is that dark matter actually exists and there's a huge body of evidence uh, to support that. Um, so today I'll, I'll try and just present um, uh, as much of the evidence for dark matter as I can, it goes much beyond rotation curves and much beyond the bullet cluster. Um, um, so I, am, I myself am not an expert, so all, all of the uh, evidence is uh, astrophysical and uh, cosmological, and I myself am not necessarily an expert uh, in this, but um, it's the sort of thing that you shouldn't leave to necessarily to experts um, and, and, uh, and, and you should be exposed to. So. Um, evidence for, for, for dark matter, I'll give you, I'm not sure I'll be able to count exactly how many pieces of evidence there are. <coughs> um, um, but let's, um, let's start. Okay, so dark matter, we only know of dark matter through its gravitational interactions, right? Um, the search for dark matter, as, as we, we like to call it, is, uh, is the search for non-gravitational interactions of dark matter. But we know about it through gravity. Does anybody know when was the first instance that we discovered something only through its gravitational interaction? Hmm? I mean, Newton's laws? Uh, Newton's laws um, no, wh when did we discover uh, uh, about a new uh, piece of matter? Yes. Planets? Uh, that's right. Which one? Okay. So, <coughs> often dark matter is associated with Zwicky, uh, 1933, but uh, discovering matter through its gravitational interactions uh, actually go dates back to, let me check my notes, 18 1845. Um... Uh, Leverrier and Adams um, inspected um, the orbit of Uranus uh, very carefully and discovered some wiggles and uh, anomalies. Uh, and this is how we discovered Neptune. Okay? Um, so we discovered Neptune this way. Neptune was dark matter at the time because we didn't detect it optically. Uh, in fact, uh, I read last night um, that even a year before these uh, fellows discovered Neptune, Bessel, <laughs> the guy from the Bessel functions, if you could <laughs> believe it, um, uh, pointed out that uh, some, some, st some stars were wiggling around in the sky in, in an odd way, and he postulated that maybe they are part of a binary and the, and the uh, binary partner is too dim. Uh, so so uh, 1840s is when, when we first Starting, started looking for matter through gravitational interactions. Fast forward to uh, 
1933, uh, Zwicky. Um, so Zwicky, again, if you go to Dark Matter Talks, sometimes you see a picture of a, a, a guy doing this. He, he, he's, um, he, he was caught on camera doing a funny face one time, and uh, he's, he's uh, always depicted this way. Um, he, uh, he inspected the <coughs> velocity of galaxies uh, in the uh, coma cluster. It's a cluster of galaxies, a bunch of galaxies uh, uh, bound together. Uh, and uh, he discovered that uh, the galaxies were moving way too fast. In order, if, if um, you assume that the galaxies you see um, in the coma cluster uh, are all there is. Um, so why, why do, um, so Virial ther Theorem uh, tells us that uh, very roughly up to factors of two as always, um, the potential energy and the kinetic energy of objects in a virially bound uh, object uh, are related. The velocities are related to um, um, to the kinetic energy, <coughs> the mass, to the potential energy. So if you measure velocities, you can measure uh, mass. We'll, we'll do this a bit more uh, precisely with uh, rotation curves. Okay, so that's, uh, so um, Zwicky coined the term dark matter uh, in German, dunkel materia, is that Roughly right? Okay. Um, very good. <coughs> and now, um, uh, well, I wasn't around back then, so, so I don't know to what degree this was forgotten or not. Um, but in the 1970s, there was an explosion uh, pioneered mostly by Vera Rubin, um, who should be getting a Nobel Prize, but that's just my opinion. Um, uh, and that is uh, galactic rotation curves. Okay, so galactic rotation curves. Uh, so I would consider this, this was all like uh, historical um, pre-trial motions, okay? Um, this is the first actual bit of uh, evidence, okay? I was just uh, um <coughs> uh, just playing around until now. So uh, what are galactic rotation curves? You take a galaxy. Um, so galaxies are often these spiral disks, um, like ours. And you look at it from the side. So here's the galaxy in this plane. So there's a bulge and a disk, uh, and you uh, can study this galaxy optically and spectroscopically. And through uh, Doppler shifts, you can tell the, uh, the velocity of the stars in the galaxy in and out of uh, this blackboard on average, okay? Uh, so you can study that. You can study this as a function of the radial component R. You can do this for, now, you can do this for one galaxy, you can do this for two, and every galaxy is a bit different, and, uh, you know, stuff happens. Um, but this was done for many, many, many galaxies. Um, so, first of all, uh, what would you uh, expect? Uh, well, the, the gravitational force inwards First of all, um, you can't see me uh, back there, right? Okay, so I'm I'm going. Okay, so we're measuring velocities in and out. <coughs> um, well, the gravitational force pulling in is just the mass of the whatever is pulling you inside, so this is a function of r, times the mass of the star. The star is a test, small test body, 
Uh, we're talking about galaxies with uh, 10 to the 9 and above stars. Um, over R squared. Uh, and you set this equal to the uh, centripetal force. Uh, and then you, uh, you can solve for the uh, velocity, and you expect the velocity to fall like uh, 1 over the square root of r. Right? Okay. So if you plot this, this is a rotation curve now. You expect, well, here in the middle, the, the mass is still, this m of r is still picking up. But <coughs> galaxies, what, what you do is um, you look outside the, most the brightest region. So galaxies shine light significantly within 5 kiloparsecs of the uh, center. A kiloparsec is uh, 1,000 light years times 3, I think. Um, uh, we're 8 kiloparsecs from the center of our own galaxy, so we're really sort of at the suburbs <coughs> of our galaxy. Um, so you look um, well outside the region where most of the stars are, so then you'd expect this m of r, assuming mass and light are correlated with one another, one to one, uh, that, um, that m of r will stop changing significantly. It's the mass within this thing. Uh, so it should just scale like 1 over square root of r. Uh, after a region where it's uh, sort of fuzzy, you'd expect it to sort of go up like this and go down. And famously, you see something like that. So this is the no dark matter hypothesis. Questions? This is nice and simple. Um, okay. Um, now, this was used in galaxies initially, many galaxies. These days, this is used in smaller galaxies uh, than our own, sort of uh, the so-called dwarf galaxies, um, and bigger ones, so it's, it's at any scale. Um, one may ask, uh, how about us? How about our galaxy? Um, do we have... Uh, so maybe we're, we're there's dark matter in all galaxies, and we're um, stuck in the only one that doesn't have any. And then any search for dark matter, say, using direct detection, wouldn't work. So do we have dark matter? Um, and it turns out that, <coughs> uh, yes, we do. Our rotation curves curve looks roughly like this. Um, and the way you do it, so um, as opposed to any other galaxy, um, we cannot step outside of our galaxy and uh, measure it from the side. Uh, well, some galaxies don't face the right way, and then we give up on them. Um, but ours we give up on from uh, day one. But you can do other things uh, and look at... Um, there have been uh, surveys for the 21 centimeter line, um, which is um, a faint line in, in uh, uh, that comes from hyperfine splitting in, in hydrogen. Um, so we can measure that very accurately uh, with spectroscopy, do a Doppler shift uh, map of our galaxy, uh, and people have, have produced a, a rotation curve for our galaxy. So we, we also have dark matter. From um, We also have a flat rotation curve. Okay, and from this we, we learn that this is flat. So we said... This is 5 to 10, let's say 10 kiloparsecs. Out here, this stuff. Um, hold on, Gopi. Um, this extends out typically in a galaxy like our own to 200 kiloparsecs. Yes? Is the 21 centimeter line the only average that they measure for to match? No. Right, so th there's no. Um, I think it's the only way. It's the only way in which I know of where a rotation curve was produced for our galaxy. Um, but people have looked at um, the velocities of nearby stars uh, and deduced that uh, there is dark matter even locally so here. 
Um, because, because what I'm thinking is, is if you have, if you have uh, the, you're measuring the, you see this kind of behavior for other galaxies that are, you would say are similar to ours. Mm -hmm. And then you say, well, okay, but I'm not sure that I have the same behavior in this galaxy. Right. If I, if I, if I measure stars uh, around a certain way around my galaxy, um, then I can match them to other, other, other galaxies and I can send the predict a similar behavior. Or is that unnecessary? I think that's unnecessary. Okay. I think a curve like this was produced for our galaxy um, with, without any reference to any other. Uh, and in addition, um, this, uh, this measurement of the peculiar velocities of, of neighboring stars, um, which I will not tell you about beyond this, it's, it's sort of a, a recent measurement. Um, um, that is also, as, as far as I know, independent of, of just about any other galaxy. So yes, we have dark matter. Yes? Uh, why is there like a cutoff at some R? Or do we know how it goes down? I mean, there's a tail. Oh, um, uh, there should be a tail. The tail, now obviously, the problem is that you start running out of stars. The, the, the way you, 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 you used to measure this is the, the straddlers that, that are not part of the, the bulk of the mass here. But there are a few stars out in the outskirts, and you can measure those very precisely and see how far it goes. So using this method, um, it's just flat as far as we can see. Um, now, obviously, it ends. Uh, uh, <laughs> No, if it didn't end, then, then it would be just dark matter everywhere in the universe, connecting galaxies. And then dark matter wouldn't, um, well, we, we know that dark matter clumps. Um, so a clump uh, begins and a, a, a clump ends. And we've seen it end using uh, other, other methods, so, so don't worry. Um, um, yeah, so we know it extends up to... Uh, 200 uh, kiloparsec-ish. Uh, here you simply run out of uh, statistics. Okay, so 200. So that means a good representation of a galaxy really is, let, let's draw it here. Uh, here is a galaxy and this is its halo. Right? This is very different from the beautiful picture of uh, the Milky Way that fills up the whole screen. Uh, we are this small, insignificant one-fifth of the mass. Um, that's all the stars in our galaxy, and there's this big puffy halo <coughs> around us. Okay, so that's rotation curves. So that's, I would say, that's evidence number one. Uh, so from here on, I don't think I will be going in any chron chronological order <coughs> for the evidence for dark matter. Um, let's uh, let's keep try and keep track of count. Weak lensing. So uh, by weak lensing, I mean gravitational lensing. Again, we discovered dark matter only through. Uh, gravity. Um, and this is uh, what's known as galaxy galaxy lensing. This is much less well known. So, this is something you don't find out that um, introduction slide. Um, um, and, okay, let me. So, lensing is the idea, the notion that um, if, you, if you are here, looking out into, uh, into space, and there's a source mass here. This is the lens. Sorry, this is not the source. This is the lens. Uh, and there's a source here. Uh, so if there was perfect alignment, uh, famously, um, what you will see is instead of this source being a point, um, its light rays would be l uh, bent. Uh, and if there's perfect symmetry, uh, this will look like uh, a ring, right? Uh, but if there isn't perfect symmetry, uh, it will look like several rings. Um, so this is what, what is known as strong lensing, and it's not necessarily what I'm talking about. 
Um, weak lensing is the case where this is uh, the, the lensing effect is so weak that uh, you see uh, just one copy of your source. So if, if this is uh, now where the lens is, uh, you see just one copy of your source, and instead of being, uh, but, but instead of being completely round, it is somewhat squashed and uh, and and uh, uh, sheared. Okay. Uh, so so this is, if you imagine deforming this point into the ring that eventually it would be in strong lensing, this is just the beginning of it, the perturbative version of it. Okay. So. Um, uh, now, this is obviously uh, has to do with the mass of this lens. Okay? So, what do you do? Um, you, uh, well, now luckily the space is riddled with galaxies, so there are many galaxies around. There are different ones, you can tell from, from many things. Um, and you can measure how, um, how sheared um, these galaxies are. And I'm going to be very heuristic about it, um, for the most part, because I don't do this for a living. So um, I'm not very familiar with the details. Uh, and also, we, we have quite a list of evidence to go through. Um, now, of course, every of one of these galaxies has its own funny shape, um, and it's oriented in a very particular way. Uh, but if you do this for many galaxies, um, on average, these uh, source galaxies um, would be spherically symmetric. There is no correlation between these and that. Uh, and also, furthermore, you can do this for more than one lens. You can stack uh, the images for many lenses uh, and measure how sheared these guys are. So as, as I promised you, I will not tell you how sheared is measured, just because I don't know, but there are people who do this for a living. Um, uh, and this is uh, something that uh, you can quantify. Uh, so there's a quantity for shear, now, uh, which is something that you measure uh, too low. Let me do this. Haha. -ha. Excellent. So the shear is something, the left hand side is something that you measure. Uh, the right hand side is, well, what you need to do is you need to integrate, um, Let's assume for a second that there's, uh, there's mass density only here. Obviously, you'll integrate it throughout the whole uh, line of sight. Um, and you assume that there's some uh, mass density rho um, along the line of sight. And you just need to integrate that Okay. Uh, along this uh, Light of line of uh, sight. This is co something called the th that is called the uh, surface mass density. So it has units of mass per area. So it's really the amount of mass that the light goes through per area that you uh, see. So this will eventually scale like uh, well. Let's just cutting through the chase in the interest of time. Uh, this is really going like the amount of mass within this region, uh, M of R. So this reminds us of the M of R from galactic rotation curves, uh, divided by uh, R squared. Okay, this is, this is what... Uh, now, of course, this depends on how I define shear, uh, but this is, this is the, the, the shear that is defined in this field. Uh, and then you can uh, see how this also behaves as a function of, of R. So you define a measure for how squashed galaxies are, um, and you go along from the center uh, on out. Uh, this, by the way, doesn't need to be invisible. There are stars here in, in, the, in the lens. 
Now, again, just like the rotation curves, you can make the hypothesis that there is mass only where you see light, which is very near the center of the galaxy. So you would expect this to go like, um, most plots that I will make are log log without me telling you. Okay, so assume that. Uh, you'd expect the slope of minus two. Uh, and uh, do I have the reference here? No, I don't have the reference. Um, I owe you a if, if anybody wants to see a plot like this, uh, let me know. I'll find the reference. Um, but but the, uh, the data is sig significantly flatter. Okay, again, like rotation curves, this is telling us that there is more mass here than, uh, than, what, you, uh, than what you see. Okay? Um, so that's weak lensing. Questions about we weak lensing? Excuse me? Big R, it has a radial distance. Yes. Um, and big M, it has the amount of matter that's all the way from your server to the objector. Um, yeah, I haven't defined it properly here. Uh, for the sake of, of this, it, it will be um, the amount of mass. So if, if I define um, other way around. Ha. Um, so now if I'm looking at, at the lens, um, I define a cylinder around it yeah. okay. of radius r. It is the amount of mass inside that cylinder. Um, integrated along the whole damn line of sight, but that is, in, in, in these uh, cases, um, in, this in, in this perfect case of just this guy, uh, this is uh, highly dominated by the lens itself. Now, people that actually do this need to take count ta need, need to take uh, into account all the other crap around, but that's uh, how it's uh, defined. Okay. Great. So now I told you about uh, galaxies. Um, so this was, again, this was the case, um, there have been studies where this, this lens is a galaxy. Uh, how about um, other scales? So let's talk about clusters. Uh, so so that's a completely separate uh, piece of evidence on a completely different um, mass scale and length scale uh, for dark matter. How am I doing with time? Ooh, terrible. Okay, so uh, clusters are clusters of galaxies. Okay, so it's a group of 10 or more, uh, 10 to hundreds to m more galaxies uh, that, are that we know that they're close together. They're not moving... Uh, away from one another very quickly, so they must be gravitationally bound to one another. Okay, so it's this, um, it, it's, a, a, it's, a, uh, it's a collection of galaxies. Uh, now, remember Zwicky from 1933, um, that was a cluster that he looked at. So we already have like uh, circumstantial lame sort of evidence. Um, I mean, Zwicky wasn't lame, it's just that he didn't have the technology. Um, um, so, but since Wiki, uh, the study of clusters has come a long way, a very long way. Uh, so let's, uh, let me tell you how this field has evolved in the last, uh, um, 80 years or so. Um, okay, so, so what can you, uh, th there are various, uh, pieces of information, various ways that you can uh, weigh a uh, cluster, see what its mass is. So the first thing is obviously um, the, the galaxies. So you just see a collection of point sources, if you like. 
Um, <coughs> now, once you, um, you now that that's the that just accounts for how much light you see, and then um, in order to convert this to mass, you need um, a parameter that probably goes into a fit, which is uh, the mass to light ratio, um, which I which can be different from cluster to cluster, but but uh, there there's some number for um, for sanity. So that's one uh, bit of information you have. Um, you also have a gas. Um, so in between the galaxies, there's a lot of gas that never fell into a galaxy. Um, but because it's in such a, a big object, it is has has fallen into a deep potential well. It has gained a lot of energy and it is hot. Okay, so th the gas clouds in clusters are hot, and that means they uh, are uh, somewhat ionized and they emit X-rays from Bremsstrahlung. So you see. Um, let me take advantage of um, color. Uh, you see, in addition to these guys, in the same place, you see this uh, schmear of, uh, of x-rays, a blob of x-ray, um, which you used a different instrument to see. Um, and that tells you also about the mass that lives in here. Obviously, a more massive uh, cluster has more gas in it. That's just... Uh now, here I, I'm just giving you, uh, as opposed to uh, the previous two cases where there were ev eventually will, will be a, a money plot uh, where there will be a curve that says there's no dark matter um, uh, and now this is what we see and it, they don't agree. Here, I'll just tell you what people do to measure it, and they piece everything together, and uh, then I'll just tell you, well, dark matter is a, a component that we need, okay? Um, uh, otherwise, the puzzle do doesn't, it's just people who work in this just assume dark matter uh, all the time. I'm not aware of a, a nice money plot. Um, okay, so um, uh, x-rays, oh, uh, importantly, um, this is proportional to the uh, number density, this emission, this is Bremsstrahlung emission, so two, um, two um, uh, ions in the gas strike each other and emit a Bremsstrahlung photon, so this is proportional to the number density squared. Okay? Um, so it's, it's uh, actually quite, it makes it more, more peaky at the center. Now there's another way to see gas um, that is perhaps more recent um, and this is known as the sanayev zeldovich effect or SZ um, and this is uh, uh, upscattering uh, of CMB photons. Um, also known as inverse Compton, IC in, uh, in Astro papers. Uh, so what's going on here? Um, well, this cluster lives inside our universe, which um, has a background radiation of cosmic um, um, of, of microwaves, right? And we've studied that to death. Um, and uh, if a CMB photon goes through a cloud of gas, um, it can, with high probability, uh, scatter onto one of the atoms and get a little bit of uh, extra energy from it. So that's inverse Compton scattering. Um, so this, you can see, it, it, I, I, I think I remember the first time this was observed, uh, I believe in the either late 90s or, or uh, uh, 2000s in the CMB, so you could actually observe, say, there's a cluster um, just by looking at the CMB, which is sort of amazing. Um, but these days, uh, you can just 
people look at the CMB and say, oh, cluster there, there, and there. Okay, so uh, this has, has come quite a long way. Uh, so here you also see a schmear of uh, upscattered uh, photons. If this is too low, you didn't miss anything. It looks very much like that. Um, um, but um, importantly, this is proportional to a different power of the number density of stuff. So correlating this with that is very powerful, right? Okay. Now, in addition to all of that, oh, I have this guy up here. Um, in addition to these three bits of evidence, there is also weak lensing. Um, which is uh, much more powerful because there's more, m more mass and presumably more source galaxies, I would guess, uh, in, in the background. So I think you can do this um, if you like. Well, so there are certainly cases where you can do this on a cluster by cl cluster basis, as, as we'll mention in, in a second. Um, or you can stack them if you like. Um <coughs> so that also gives you if you like, a contour of mass. Uh, but this is just total mass. Not just what's in gas, not just what's in uh, galaxies. And then you need, you add another important component, which is simulations. Um, so you ask yourself, well, I start in the early universe <coughs> in the early universe with some overdensity and I throw um, a reasonable amount of baryons into it, it is reasonable for it to create this number of galaxies and stars and this amount of gas, etc., etc., in my simulation. Um, uh, so, so, um, so both the, the amount of... Um, baryons and the amount of dark matter and in input to to this uh, simulation and you see there are many sources of information and everything sort of hangs together um, and uh, I can tell you that it's not that if people are saying well if I took dark matter away it won't hang together is that they just stop saying that dark matter is part of this field um, in, in a very integral way so I'm sorry there's no uh, like Five sigma evidence here. It's a it's a strong qualitative piece of evidence. Yes. Yeah, sure. They have to make assumptions about the dark matter, right? When they make the simulations. Assumptions about the dark matter in what way? I don't know. Like in the way it interacts with baryons. Um, in these simulations, dark matter does not interact with baryons except gravitationally. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what I mean, if it interacts in some other way, so that you know, maybe the halo is not uniform or something. Um, if, if, if uh, dark matter interacted with baryons, and w w I, I think we'll, we'll eventually get to that, um, but if dark matter interacted with, with baryons so strongly as to um, uh, change the shape of the halo, for example, um, that would be ruled out by us looking for dark matter interacting with baryons uh, in the lab. Mm -hmm. So, so um, that could be, may that may be an input. Um, but, uh, yeah. Yes. More in clusters. Okay, so dark matter exists both on the galactic scale, the subgalactic scale with, with smaller um, dwarf galaxies, um, and, uh, and in on large mega scales, uh, like clusters. Oh, and now, now we're ready for uh, the poster child, uh, which is the bullet cluster. Okay, so the bullet cluster is a special case here. It's one instance where it just so happened that, let's see, uh, this uh, and that and this were not quite aligned in the way that you would expect. So there were actually two clusters coming together. Um, 
So two, two clusters went through each other. So the dark matter blobs are here and there. Uh, the stars also went uh, through each other because stars don't collide very often. The galaxies, sorry, not the stars. They are point particles. Uh, but the gas, which is much more diffuse, did interact and remain sort of in the middle. So you take all these components in the right way, and um, um, in one instance you can say, um, ah, look, the mass is here, and the dominant source of mass is there, uh, so dark matter. Um, and this is very nice, it's a, it's a great uh, picture, um, but it's sort of one instance. So the, uh, uh, my expert friends tell me, ah, that's just one case, this is much more compelling. Um, okay, so I told you about all sorts of evidences for dark matter, and I'm not, going, I'm not done. There's more, but let me make an observation. Um, so far, from what I've told you, I remember when I was an undergrad, I heard about this thing called dark matter, and I thought to myself, well, that's sort of absurd, <coughs> because anything, any chunk of matter that in our day-to-day -day life doesn't necessarily emit light in any significant way unless we shine light on it. And from what I told you, there's nothing um, that says that this is beyond the standard model particles lying around. Uh, it could be just baryons that are very cold and very neutral. Okay, so you could come up with theories of uh, um, maybe dust, or maybe uh, isolated planets. like little rocks flying in space. <coughs> you can think of anything. Um, uh, you know all the socks that uh, get lost in the washing <laughs> machine? Where did they all go? Maybe that's the dark matter, okay? This is the, my, uh, the theory of lost socks dark matter, LSDM, okay? So, um, can we, maybe it's LSDM. Can we rule that out? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. This is th these are all bad uh, dark matter models, and let me tell you, there are many reasons why. <coughs> um, uh, let me tell you about them. Um, so, I think we're at four, right? Um, the CMB, not CMS, <laughs> Freudian slip. <laughs> My LHC um, side is showing the CMB. <coughs> so now we're going from, from galaxies to clusters to even bigger than clusters to the whole damn universe. Um, so the CMB, uh, well, you know, it's this microwave background. We've studied it very well, and we've measured the power spectrum. Um, and again, I'm, I'm not going to describe in detail how dark matter affects um, this famous plot. Um, but um, I will give you, um, I, I will explain why it has a, a, a good reason to, to affect this. Okay, so, so um, first of all, what is this plot? This is the uh, amount of power uh, that we see on different uh, length scales. Well, in for the case of the CMB, it's not length scale, it's angular scales, because we only see a, a 2D map of the sky. Um, but um, you can translate um, an angular scale in, into a length uh, scale. Um, uh, so really, uh, what this is, is um, uh, you take two points in the sky that are uh, separated by a, a particular angle. Uh, this angle is roughly 1 over L, okay, an angle of theta. And then you um, look at the temperature of the CMB 
at two points <coughs> um, at well at point zero and at point theta. Okay, so two points that are separated by an angle theta apart. Um, so this gives you a two-point correlation function. You can do this for the whole damn sky. Um, so that gives you, that's a correlation function, and then you Fourier transform it. That's why it's one over here. Um, and that gives you this plot. Uh, now, where do these wiggles come from? Um, well, in the early universe... Hold on, let me make sure um, um, I'm not missing anything. Good. So uh, the CMB was emitted when uh, the universe went from being um, ionized, the atoms were ionized, to being completely neutral. Okay? Um, so the relevant physics is the physics of the plasma right before recombination. Even though it's not clear to me why they call it recombination, because it was never combined before. So right before combination, maybe. But I'll, I'll use recombination. Um, uh, good. So, so that plasma um, had all sorts of um, uh, forces acting on it. Where's my page of... Uh ah, yes. Um, so that... Plasma primordially had all sorts of um, uh, fluctuation, density fluctuations and temperature fluctuations in it. So uh, this is, uh, and I can Fourier decompose the, the, those fluctuations. Here's short wavelength, long wavelength. Okay, and you know the, the real answer is something like this, and then I can Fourier decompose it into these plus those plus uh, all the other ones. Now, uh, when I have a, an overdensity like this, um, what, what are the important dynamics um, uh, that, that, uh, that affect it? Well, one thing is um, just gravity, right? So gravity is an important component in uh, creating these um, acoustic oscillation, so this thing uh, will eventually start vibrating. Um, there's also something called radiation pressure that is pushing outwards. Okay? Um, <coughs> and so these things balance on their oscillations um, at all these length scales. Um, now, gravity um, is uh, related to the amount of matter, right? The energy density here. And also to dark matter. So dark matter is coming in th through its gravitational effects on the CMB. I'm not going to be much more quantitative than this, unfortunately. <coughs> um, Uh, good. So now, um, so what are these features? So it seems like there's more power at a particular scale. So this is the dominant feature, this, this first peak. Where is that coming from? That is coming from, so let's say it is this scale. So there seems to be a little bit of a resonance going on here. Uh, so th th uh, the wave that is in this scale is sort of put in a, in a box uh, or it's like a, a, s a string with a, a standing wave and it is uh, resonating at this frequency. And the relevant frequency is the frequency that these interactions, these uh, radiation pressure interactions can act causally, right? So this, this uh, wavelength is in a box. It is a wave in a box. The box is uh, the speed of sound, okay? It's how far... Uh, such waves could have traveled since the beginning of time um, uh, causally, right? So this is the sound horizon. It's um <coughs> which is related very much to um, the speed of sound, which um,
turns out to be roughly the speed of light divided by square root of 3. Um, don't ask me why. Um, however, um, if there are baryons interacting that interact with the plasma non-gravitationally, the speed of sound is actually smaller. So the, sp the speed of sound is related to the um, baryon density. And dark matter will not change the speed of sound. Okay, but normal matter will. So you see, um, both the, the normal matter density and the total matter density come into this shape. Um, so, it is, so again, this is a whole field. Uh, people fit this thing to death using this and the dark matter density and, and many other parameters as an input. Uh, and the CMB alone um, tells us that um, the dark matter density uh, is, is more than the uh, baryon density. Okay? Questions about that? This was not very detailed because, uh, again, I I'm, I'm not one of the people that do these fits for a living, but also um, we have many go things to go to to go through. Okay. Ah, so what does this have to do with the socks? Okay. Um, if dark matter was uh, the lost socks, uh, then then uh, they're made of atoms, normal atoms. And all normal atoms at, that, at this time um, were, were completely hot and disintegrated, right? So dark matter was around when, when normal stuff was in the form of plasma. So if you just take normal stuff, tables, chairs, anything, and postulate that that is dark matter, that, th that, th that it's part of the standard model, it would have melted away back then. And it would have been for example, it would have changed this fit. It would have contributed uh, here to the change of the speed of sound, but it would, well, it w uh, may or may not have contributed to, to this uh, form of matter, the, the matter that does not couple to, uh, to the photons. Okay, so, uh, so just from the CMB alone, we know uh, how much baryons there are, how much dark matter there is, and we know that dark matter is a particle beyond, beyond what we know, beyond the stutter model. <coughs> so it's very powerful. Questions? Ooh, I need to hurry on. I think I'm at five. So if you haven't noticed the, um, in this trial, the, the, the strategy is to shock you with uh, shock and awe with, with uh, many, many, many <coughs> evidences for dark matter so that when you go home to work, you're bothered that dark matter actually exists. This is not just something that people tell us in the first slide of talks. It actually exists in the universe, so you should all think about it. Um, <coughs> okay, another um, reason we know that there is dark matter so this is number five. I think it's five. Uh, is the something called the matter power spectrum. And that is a story that is very similar to the CMB power spectrum. Um, <coughs> only the thing that you're measuring now is not the temperature of the CMB at different angles. <coughs> Uh, but it's the uh, density of matter um, at different locations. So it's more of a 3D, has more of a 3D feel to it. <coughs> um, and it looks something like this. Um, so this is uh, wave number, is often called K. Uh, and has a very significant peak and a little bit of wiggles here. So first let me tell you how this is measured. So on the very, uh, oh, um, 
Again, because uh, it's cosmology, it's meant to be a bit confusing. Um, there's large scales and small scales. The notation is. The cosmology is simple. The notation is confusing. Um, there are large scales and small scales. Um, and obviously, large scales are here. So small k is a large scale. Very good. And uh, where it so this comes, well, the CMB is the largest scales. And then there are clusters, cluster surveys. And galaxies. And on smaller scales, there's something called Lyman Alpha surveys, which uh, it, it looks at the density of gas. Um, so there are many bits of information that we use to measure this one quantity. <coughs> um, okay, so that's a very it's a beautiful measurement. Um, and again, um, now this is in s in, s in many ways related to the CMB. See, the CMB is an input to this to this uh, uh, plot. And again, like the like the CMB, there's there um, gravity is pushing in, and uh, radiation radiation pressure is uh, pushing out. Now, in order to um, the main feature in this plot is again this this peak. Uh, and we can understand um, the, the location of this peak uh, is very much related to, um, to the dark matter density. So let me again uh, show you a cartoon of why that is. Um, so uh, again, the, the time in question is, um, uh, or l l more precisely, uh, this peak tells us the time at which uh, matter and radiation were equal in the universe. Matter radiation equality. Very briefly, um, I'm sure you've you've seen this. Um, if we look at the um, uh, history of the universe, um, in the early times, radiation dominated. So this is energy density. And it's scale like uh, one over a to the fourth. A is the scale factor. Um, and in later times, um, matter dominated. Matter only scales like one over a cube. Um, so this is rad, and this is mat. Radiation matter. And obviously, obviously, this time of matter radiation equality is sensitive to how much matter there is. Okay, so if I measure this time, I measure how much matter and thus how much dark matter there is in the universe. Um, so, in order to uh, understand uh, how this comes into this plot, we need to understand how um, how the power spectrum, how these perturbations grow um, at the time of um, uh, at these times. So this time is, is uh, simple. Everything just m matter dominates. Matter is, uh, is king in the universe at, at later times. So over densities simply grow. Radiation has, so this, this radiation pressure is not very important. Um, well, it is in some in some instances in the universe but in the grand scheme of things it is not just gravity does its thing so um but um uh in the uh in the uh earlier time when radiation uh was dominant then so radiation doesn't clump very well because it it's if if there's an over density light particles uh, uh, fly out. Um, and, uh, well, baryons just um, 
parents cannot decouple from radiation, so they, they, they're, they're, uh, um, they don't clump at all, essentially, uh, because um, um, electrons um, just, uh, every time they, 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 they want to go somewhere, a, a photon knocks them and uh, pushes them some other way. So if, if the photons don't clump, the, f the electrons will not clump uh, either. Dark matter, in principle, can clump uh, during radiation uh, domination. But it doesn't clump very well either. Um, and the reason is that the universe is dominated um, gravitationally. The, 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 the energy density, which is what gravitates, is dominated by radiation, which doesn't clump very much. So dark matter also, to some degree, follows the radiation around and doesn't clump uh, very much. So radiation pressure affects dark matter as well, but only in the radiation-dominated era. Okay? Now, this, um, the same thing that happened in, in the CMB case um, happens here. Radiation pressure is very effective at preventing clumping, but only up to some scale of that has to do with the sound horizon. Or the people call it the gene's length. It has to do with the same gene's length that shows up in astrophysics, if, if uh, you've heard of that. So, um, um, so wha wha what do we know? Um, in the radiation era, um, nobody's clumping too much. Dark matter uh, clumps a little bit. Um, and on small scales, so small scales is here, um, uh, it's the, the clumping of dark matter um, would happen, but it is prevented by radiation, right? Because radiation gravitate gravitates with dark matter and pulls it back out. Um, but on long scales, radiation pressure cannot uh, do its thing. So if I had some primordial power spectrum that looked like this, let me just postulate that, you can, um, you can see how this would turn into that because uh, the radiation in the universe suppresses uh, structural growth on small scales. Okay, this was a bit quick, but this is... Uh, um, the cartoon, and I, I would urge you to look it up. Um, in any case, uh, the, uh, the the place at, at, at which this, uh, this mechanism of suppressing scale ceases to be effective is when radiation cannot act causally anymore, right? This sound horizon story. Okay? So this tells us this, this length, this is a length scale. This Wave number, invert it, it's a length scale. That length scale is the sound horizon at matter radiation equality. So by we're measuring this peak at matter radiation equality. Uh, and so we're, we're sensitive to uh, the amount of dark matter. Okay, also having to do with, uh, this is something I'll just say in words, something that's also important for structure formation one other bit of evidence for, so this would be maybe five prime. Um, another bit of evidence for dark matter is the fact that we're here, right? So you and I are all evidence for dark matter, and why is that? Uh, we are a nonlinear perturbation, right? Um, um, delta rho over rho for us is one. And if you uh, took some facts about our universe um, and simply removed dark matter uh, uh, from it, um, we wouldn't have any enough time to, to create dark matter. So wh wh why is that? Uh, I'll briefly tell you. Uh, so recombination, this is when the CMB was emitted, was at a redshift of 10 to the minus 3. The, the universe expanded a thousandfold since then. Um, the, uh, what I didn't tell you is that um, during, uh, uh, ever since matter dominated, the universe structure grows linearly. Okay, with, with this, this redshift, with this uh, scale factor. Okay, so linear growth, 10 to the minus 3. So between 10 to the, the minus 3 and today, there's, there was enough time for structure to go by a factor of 1,000. Now let me also tell you that um, the, 
Um, the starting point for this quantity the of, of, uh, of perturbations uh, uh, is, is 10 to the minus 5. Okay, so um, not all of structure um, could have formed after uh, recombination. Okay, S structure formation needed a head start. In order to do that, you need matter that doesn't couple to the photons because baryons do not clump at all um, before recombination. So uh, recombination and matter um, radiation equality are near each other, but they're very different physics. Um, um, so I just told you that, that there is not much matter growth, not, not much uh, growth of structure in radiation domination, but baryons wouldn't just do, uh, w w won't grow uh, structure at all um, before they can decouple from photons, before recombination. So without dark matter, we, 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 wouldn't have, uh, um, we wouldn't have time to get here. <coughs> so that's important. So dark matter is important in your day-to-day -day life, or it used to be. Okay. I'm con seriously considering skipping one, one bit of uh, information. I'll, okay, I'll, I'll do it. I'll say it very quickly, which is <coughs> Big Bang nuclear synthesis. <coughs> um, so Big Bang nuclear synthesis is, um, is uh, the, the, the process which brought about all of the heavy elements. Oh, sorry, not all of the heavy elements. Um, <coughs> the, the heavy elements that did form in the early universe. So the abundance of um, hydrogen, deuterium, helium, <coughs> nuclear synthesis. <coughs> and it's just the, um, um, now, again, I, I'm, I, I don't have uh, time to uh, go into it in gory detail, but what you need to do to uh, understand nuclear synthesis is <coughs> throw some hot matter into uh, a pot, very hot matter, more than MeV of temperatures, um, and then let that pot ex expand at some rate. Uh, and the expansion rate is um, a function of the energy density. So that's, that's just it. And then ask you do, do some um, um, reaction rates calculations with appropriate Boltzmann tails, um, and, um, and you'll, you'll get some abundances of nuclei. Now that sounds simple, but it's, it's really not, um, which is... Uh, uh, why I'm not uh, um, go going to do this in, in great detail. I, I want to tell you some stuff we know about dark matter before we end for today. Um, but um, you can imagine uh, uh, that the, wha what th well, what's really important, the, the, the important things are uh, the cross sections for two nuclei coming together uh, and having a nuclear interaction and changing from so, for, for example, uh, two protons coming together and turning into deuterium, a nuclear uh, interaction. Um, two deuteriums coming together, forming helium. These cross-sections are all uh, input. Um, so, it's the cross-sections that are important. But in order to get rates, you need to multiply by um, number densities and by a velocity. The velocity has to do with the temperature at the time. The velocity was very high, everything was very hot. Actually, not everything was very hot. Um, the, the okay, the velocity was not high because everything weighted GeV and we're talking about MeV temperatures. Uh, so the velocity was actually quite slow, but um, these number densities are important. So this, if you work out the units, this is a rate per unit volume. Um, so the number density of baryons, which are the things that are interacting, um, are going to be important. So the reason I'm sort of suppressing this as evidence is that the BBN really gives you us um, evidence for what the energy density is in baryons. Um, and then it comes in as input to all these other things that are sensitive to the amount of matter um, and Well, I don't know about very, but um, there is a factor of five or six between matter and, and baryons in the universe. So that's more evidence. There's more. 
But let me uh, switch gears. Questions before I do that. Is anybody not convinced that there's dark matter in the universe? <laughs> Come see me after. Don't be shy. I'd, I'd be happy to talk about it. Um, so it exists. It's that that's uh, it's it's troubling. What is it? That should keep us all up at night. Um, <coughs> so now let me um, sticking to facts today. Yes. So we probably should like make remarks. Something the solar and the assumptions and general relativity works. You know, at this at scale. Oh yes. Um, yeah, I'm assuming general relativity works on all scales. Um, yeah. Okay. So so let's let's uh, okay um, let's mention Mond. Okay, Mond is modified Newtonian dynamics, and that is the assumption that general relativity does not work at all scales. Um, and that was invoked to explain evidence number. Is it still on the board? No, uh, or ma maybe it's it is back there. Um, that was invoked in order to uh, explain rotation curves away. Oh, this thing, evidence number one. Um, so that just modified the laws of gravity, uh, so that bit was erased. So this is the no dark matter hypothesis. Um, and uh, Mond uh, postulates that the, the Newtonian gravity is not the way that, uh, that would give you this. It's modified and it gives you that, without new matter. Um, however, uh, I would argue it addressed this bit of information. Uh, let's see. Uh, gravitational lensing? No, it wouldn't do that, uh, I don't think. Um, Right. So so now um, so now I, I, I've I've given you five or six pieces of evidence and and now you 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 say okay I'll address evidence number one with this uh, very exotic uh, bit of physics I'll uh, I'll address uh, now um, evidence number two with something else. Oh, if that's okay, uh. that's okay. Well, I mean that's good. Right. Yeah. So it's I, I would say it's much much less compelling. Um, but um, whereas dark matter is just one more, one more particle. Um, so it's, it's um, I would say it's compelling that dark matter single-handedly addresses all of this uh, evidence. Yes? What evidence do we have that dark matter is a particle? Um, we, do, we, we don't know that it's a particle. W we know that it is... Um, it is, uh, again, it's not in the category of, of chunks of matter that we know of, okay? Um, uh, so it is not one of the particles of the standard model. That leaves, if you think about it, um, it leaves black holes, um, but there are constraints on that. I can, um, uh, I don't have them at the top of my head. Or new particles. Or or exotic matter that is not part of which is even crazier than just new particles, right? Yeah, just uh, stuff, not right? yeah, okay. That 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 means basically particle is just perturbative. Oh yeah, perturbative so certainly. Perturbative. Dark matter can certainly be composite. Absolutely. Um, let's call the proton and the neutron a particle for, for this, and then and then dark matter is, is a particle. Um, so yeah, so it can certainly be a composite particle. Th 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 there's certainly no problem with that. Um, there are constraints th that we can. Right, and we should question that. So uh, I think black holes, primordial black holes, somehow are the only viable candidate that, that I know of that I wouldn't call a particle, really. Um, at least. Black holes can be part of the standard model, but then you need to explain how they, they uh, came to be there. Um, and, and there are constraints on them. Um, let me tell you uh, in the last 10 minutes or so, 
um, what we know about dark matter. <coughs> so all I told you so far is that it exists, but let me give you a list of things we know. Um, okay, well, first of all, how much of it is there? <coughs> well, it's uh, of order 23%. Uh, I, I never follow the exact numbers uh, of the universe, of the uh, energy density of the universe. You've seen these pie charts um, and the uh, rho uh, dark matter to rho uh, baryons to standard model stuff is of order 5 ish um, so these are th both of these numbers have been strong input to model building, uh, and we'll get to particularly this one next time. Um, but also, it's it's somewhat surprising that this number, this number could have been anything, ten to the whatever, um, either plus or minus ten to the plus five or ten to the minus five. A priori, this could have been, um, but um, but it's a number of order one, which uh, s some people uh, find intriguing. Well, I find intriguing, um, and I'm happy to dismiss it on some days. Um, let's see, what else? Um, dark matter, uh, right, just looking up some numbers. Uh, it is dark. Dark matter is dark. So, uh, not charged. Uh, the charge of dark matter is, uh, from constraints of, of halo dynamics, um, is uh, ten to the m smaller than 10 to the minus 6. Um, for a dark matter mass of 10 GeV. And it's 10 to the minus 4, as I've looked up, for 10 TeV. Um, why is it a function of the dark matter mass? Because um, we know how much dark matter there is, so the number density, if, if I increase the mass, the number density uh, needs to go down to compensate, to keep the energy density fixed. Um, so dark matter is uh, not charged, barely charged, if at all. Um, it also does not interact with itself. I, very much. Now there are bounds on everything. So the cross section, again, let me make sure I'm uh, not cheating, is less than 10 to the uh, minus 22 centimeters squared. Uh, and this is for 100 GV dark matter. This is coming to again from um, from things we know about the uh, shapes of, of halos. This is actually not a very small cross section. If you feel free to convert it to barns or uh, pico barns or whatever. Um, so this is this is so dark matter could be composite quite big and in interact geometrically so long as it's smaller than this. Okay. Um, and in fact, there are anomalies um, um, that have to do with um, the shape of dark matter halos near their center, cusp versus core, which I may or may not uh, get to, um, um, that are evidence that maybe there is some uh, interaction, right? 
Here's an expert. Ask him. Yes. I heard you give a talk about this, right? Yes. Yes, there was a question. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, great, yeah, so we w one thing we don't know is, we don't know that dark matter is one particle, that we certainly do not know. Um, uh, an analogy that I heard from uh, Neil Weiner once uh, is that if you told um, somebody in the dark sector that th th they've worked out everything and there's this missing 5% of the universe that they don't understand, um, so then they can have arguments about, well, maybe it's just one particle, 5%, one particle. And then some other theorists would come and say, oh, maybe I have them all. It's like SU3 cross SU2 cross U1. And then I uh, spontaneously break the SU2 and let the SU3 com confine. Um, so um, the, the, the those dark people would think that that dark theorist is crazy, but he's right, right? So... Um, uh, in other words, why is, uh, if given that everything we see is so complicated, why should the dark sector be so simple? Um, yet, um, we, we often work with one dark matter particle just as a starting point. Um, but uh, it, it certainly deserves more uh, attention. Yes? So by charge, you mean only one coupling, but what about yeah, yeah. other couplings, SU3, SU3? Uh, SU3 um, no, so I if it was charged under SU3, it would confine, right? Why not? Uh, why not? Because uh, then um, it would interact with, well, it w um, so let's say it's a triplet. Uh, then it confines, it, it picks up uh, another up and a down quark to form a baryon. So now we have an exotic new baryon, which is probably charged. Uh, so that's probably very ruled out. Um, th things like this. Also, this would be violated. This is already strong interaction cross sections, but but um, l looking for exotic stable heavy particles uh, would rule this out. Um, let's see what else do we know about dark, dark matter? We know dark matter is cold dark matter. Um, uh, and what do we mean by that? Dark matter is cold. Well, we know that it's cold today. It's not moving very quickly. And we know it was non-relativistic at uh, when the universe had a temperature of around a kV. That is what we mean by cold dark matter. The reason we know that is that if dark matter was uh, any hotter than that, um, that would affect structure formation. It would have affect the um, the plot that I erased of the the matter power spectrum that had k here and power here. Um, so small scales were here, um, and here this this tail is probing scales of when the universe was uh, a kV. So if the if dark matter was what is hotter, this curve structure formation would have been suppressed here. So dark matter is cold. <coughs> uh, what else do we know about dark matter? Uh, sorry. Yes. Uh, how axions uh, avoid this argument? Uh, dark, um, th they're cold. Uh, I didn't say that they're uh, heavier than a kV. Um, uh, th they're just uh, non-relativistic. When our sector in the universe was a kV temperature, um, if, if dark matter doesn't interact with us very much, it is not in equilibrium with us, uh, then it can coexist co as, as a cold um, population while we are hot, okay, while we are this hot. And that's how axions get around this. Good question. Um, and I, I'll, I'll discuss axions a little bit more uh, next time, hopefully. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, the lifetime. Can anybody guess what the lifetime of dark matter can be? Longer than what? The, the age of the universe, that's a good guess. Um, it turns out, so that, that is certainly true, because, but if, if dark matter had a lifetime of the age of the universe, 
would be sort of decaying now, right? And we would see the decay product. Um, so um, if you just look at, um, however, there's a ton of dark matter uh, lying around, and we look at the sky, we don't see it glowing from dark matter decays. Uh, so just um, uh, just from looking at the sky and now assuming what it decays into, if it decays into any standard model particle, uh, the lifetimes are bigger than uh, 10 to the 25 to 10 to the 29 seconds. Um, who remembers what the age of the universe is in, in seconds? 10 to the 10 to the 17. Okay? So this is much longer than the age of the universe. Okay, dark matter needs to be pretty darn stable. Um, let's finish with the mass. What is the mass of dark matter? Uh, actually, I don't want to end this here. <coughs> so this is the Planck mass. Mass. So dark matter could be, I mean, if it's a particle, it conceivably it could be anything with masses up to the Planck scale. <coughs> <coughs> we don't know um, of any reason except for our theoretical prejudices that it's... Uh, um, not not say around here. <coughs> How about here? Um, if dark matter had a mass that is, if if its uh, de Broglie wavelength was uh, l la larger than an actual galaxy that we observe today, that's not a good dark matter candidate, right? Dark matter needs to be able to localize itself at least within uh, the smallest galaxy uh, that we know contains dark matter. And that is, if you convert energies to length scales, 10 to the minus 22 electron volts. Absurd. From here to there. Um, <coughs> there's one point in the middle that is um, worth noting, which is <coughs> around, let's say, 10 EV, which is, uh, if dark matter um, is lighter than this, if you want to explain uh, the energy density that we see in dark matter, um, the particles that are make up dark matter really start to overlap with one another. So their wavelength is their wavelength is this big, but uh, I need to have one every this far apart. Then you see they, they their wavelength really overlap. So that means fermions cannot live here. Pauli exclusion principle really forbids fermions from living here. So really, here it's <coughs> a, pop a population of bosons. Here it could be uh, bosons or fermions. Um, beyond that, we don't know, and, and um, most of the activity has been around here. It's few to, um, I'm not sure I was accurate. Um, a few, uh, a few to a few hundreds of GV, and there's very good reason why we focus here. Um, but um, there's, there's in recent years there's been a lot of activity um, almost anywhere in this plane. Actually, here there's not that much. Uh, here there's a lot of uh, recent activity. Um, so I think. Um, so I'm around. If anybody is not convinced that there is dark matter, um, let's talk about it. <laughs> let's let's um, let's vent it out. Um, uh, yeah, I'll see y'all tomorrow. <laughs>